day traders are using my book to understand where they're stuck and where they're not willing to increase their number of trades. I would have never imagined that what I learned to do is now having so many different impacts in so many different places in the world. You're listening to The Life & Money Show, a podcast that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth for their families and impacting the world around them. And now here are your hosts, Annie Dickerson and Julie Lamb. Hello, everyone. I'm Annie Dickerson here together with the one, the only Julie. Julie Lamb. Julie, how are you today? I'm good. It's funny. Today's Halloween. So we're recording on Halloween and D on our team yeah. showed up as an egg. <laughs> as a, cracking me dinner. up. <laughs> it was cracking me up so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said after, so this is for our team standup, which we do every day with our whole team. Everybody gets on, we say hi, and we share out what we accomplished the day before and what we're working on the day of. And after she shared her updates, she said, yep, so it's an over easy day. <laughs> I love it. Somehow everybody who comes within our sphere eventually gets down to the egg jokes. It's inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good day. Good day for jokes and costumes and things. What are you going to be this year? I think we'll talk about this. Did you guys decide? Yes something? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So we're sort of a plants versus zombies theme. Yeah. So I will be the sunflower from the plants versus oh, zombies. Um, <laughs> yes. So creating the sun, all the energy for everybody else. And then my younger son is going to be a pea shooter. Mm-hmm. And my husband is going to be a zombie. And then our other son decided he wanted to do something completely different. So he's going to be a magician. <laughs> oh, okay. Didn't want to join the crew, huh? No, no. <laughs> what about you and your family? We are doing Harry Potter. So I'm the owl. So I will That's be right. rigged. Yes. Right. I, which, when I saw D show up today, I'm like, I wore my costume and <laughs> Did a little joke, but yeah, so I'm going to paint my face white because there's like the same thing like as D's with the little hole in the thing. So yeah, I'm going to be the owl and everybody else is like Harry and all the other characters. So it should be fun. That's super fun. A whole great cast of characters. Oh, man. (laughs) How fun. Well, let's talk a little bit about our guest Uh today. She's been on the podcast before. Her name is Lisa Peterson. She's one of our good friends and she's a money coach. She's a fellow podcast host. She's founder of The Wealth Clinic, which has grown and become so successful. And she's also the author of The Mindful Millionaire. And every time I talk with Lisa, it's just so fascinating how she's able to bridge this gap between money and spiritual development or psychology and personal growth and development. I think it's so fascinating. We talk about this all the time, how fascinating it is because when people come to invest with us, the investing is just a tiny sliver of their overall money picture. And we don't always get to dig in as deep as Lisa does with people, but she talks on the show about how people's money habits, money patterns are formed before the age of seven. And often, even when they're 50, 60 years old, they're still operating on the same system that they had created, the same framework that they had subconsciously created when they were five and six years old. And she talks about how she helps people to find their edges and overcome them. Finding the edges piece for me was so interesting of a way to really look at all of this money talk and money mindset. I think once somebody can really discover what their edge is, and I talked about this a little bit on the show, and then going just beyond that to ask the questions that need to be asked to move yourself and your investments and decisions that you make beyond wherever your edge is that you can find wild success. It's really crazy. We talked about that for me personally and how I went through that and found my edge when I met you. And then here we are now. So I don't think I've read the book. Have you read her book? I need to go out and get it. I have it. I started it, but I haven't finished it. So I need to add it to my stack. So it's so fascinating because 
I think oftentimes, especially too, as women, first of all, you have to even acknowledge, like she said, the edge and then where the edge is, right? And then to even ask the questions to get beyond that. But her whole book is to, and her purpose, why she wants to be here is to help people find what she calls these breakthroughs to overcome their edge, to move forward in their journeys of money, their money journey and building wealth. Mm. So yeah, I need to go get her book. Yeah. And it's so fascinating to me how it doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter what that number in the bank is. Everybody yep. has edges around their finances. If you've got no money in the bank and you've got these big aspirations, you've got edges and habits you've got to break and new pathways you've got to form. But even if you do have money in the bank, still a lot of people have fears, doubts, worries around yeah. money. I feel like it's even more. You have yeah, more that's true. Because more money, more problems, right? So the more money yeah. you have, the more. <laughs> Here. So even if you're out there listening and you're like, well, this isn't for me and I'm not trying to build my wealth, it's an interesting thing to look at because you might discover that you have these edges that you didn't even know existed. And how can the discovery of those edges lead you to more personal growth as well as financial growth? Yeah. And money is part of everything in our lives. And to the extent that you can become aware of your edges and where you stand in relation to your relationship with money and where you want to be, it has the power to transform everything in your life. And so for all of our listeners, no matter where you are on your journey, I highly recommend you getting a copy of Lisa's book. It's called The Mindful Millionaire. And right behind that, definitely get a copy of our book too. It is called Investing for Good. We have a free hardcover copy for all of you. And our book is specifically related to investing in real estate, particularly through real estate syndications, which are group investments, which is what we focus on at Good Egg Investments. And I'll take you through all the ins and outs of how to invest, the process, the risks, the benefits, how it relates to building wealth, all of it. And so it's a great complement to Lisa's book as well. So to get a copy of our book, go to goodegginvestments.com slash book. With that, let's dive into our conversation with Lisa Peterson. Lisa, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. We are thrilled to have you back. Now, for our longtime listeners, you may remember Lisa as one of the OG, so to speak. She was on episode number six way back when we launched this podcast almost three years ago, which is crazy to think about. But since then, obviously, the podcast has grown and flourished, and so has Lisa and her business, which is why we wanted to have her back on the show. So, Lisa, since we last talked, you've done a lot of incredible things, one of the most notable of which is publishing your book, The Mindful Millionaire, which we definitely want to dive further into with you today. But first, for all our listeners who may not yet know you and your background, tell us a little bit about your story, maybe some of the highlights, how you got into entrepreneurship in the first place and have become the Mindful Millionaire Maker. Thank you for that question. So I grew up in the Bay Area. I went into finance early in life. So 30 years now working in financial services in one capacity or another, eventually becoming a certified financial planner. But I was also a mortgage underwriter, a mortgage banker, and a whole bunch of other things. It's interesting too, that my husband and I have been involved in real estate development for the past 30 years as well. And my business that I started coming up on nine years ago was all planted with a seed that we live our lives in this pattern of scarcity. It's like the seed that we swim in. And because it's so close to us, we don't realize that we can question some of the assumptions of the society that we live in. And because I've been working with people and money for all those years, I saw these patterns. I saw how they showed up for people. And I wanted to break those patterns. And I started this business coming into it saying, how can I help people have a healthier relationship with money and have that translate into not just money, dollars and cents, but also the freedom and the inner peace that I think many of us want, but it continues to remain elusive. And so I bridged this path of the external financial wealth building with the internal development of courage and passion and purpose and brought those two worlds together. That brings me to today. 
What were some of the symptoms that you were seeing with people? Like, because money is so pervasive in our lives. I think a lot of people don't even realize how pervasive money is in everything that they do, every decision that they make, a lot of the things that they think about or come across day to day. So how does that come out when you're not being mindful of your approach to money or how you're thinking about money? What were some of the symptoms you were seeing? And then have you seen now that people, you're guiding people through to this mindful approach, what can they expect to see on the other side? The things that I was seeing, especially as a financial advisor, but in all the jobs that I worked in, whether it was direct with consumers or also working as an executive inside of a big bank, I just continued to notice things like there wasn't alignment in what we said and what we actually did with our money. And so it would be like, oh, I want to have lots of money, but then I would spend my money in all these ways that left nothing at the end of the day to save, for example. Or I would see the dynamics show up, especially when I was a mortgage banker and later as a financial advisor, where couples would come in and say, well, we want to buy this house and this is what's happening. And then I saw these roles play out where one person was like a sabotage person in the relationship who would just create all kinds of problems for the transaction. And then the other person would be enabling and kind of supporting it. And I thought, what is going on? Like, it's a really simple thing. We're just trying to buy a house. And yet all these dynamics were playing out. And I got to see behind the scenes where people would live very, very flashy lifestyles. And I could barely get them covered for a pretty simple mortgage. And it was like, wait a minute, many people are not in truth or in integrity with the life that they're living. And that those were some of the things that we could go on for days. But does that give an idea? Yeah. So it sounds like you realized it wasn't just about what was on the application or what was on paper. There was a lot going on with the dynamics, as you spoke about, behind the scenes. And so then, okay, so you saw this going on and you saw sort of this pattern emerge and you were like, what is going on? And so at that point, were you like, okay, well, clearly this isn't what you did, but some people I'm sure would be like, well, that's not my problem. My problem is helping people to get the loan approved or not. And if they can't get their stuff together, then that's not my job, right? But you clearly stepped beyond that and you were like, well, clearly I see a pattern. How can I help people beyond the boundaries of my role here? So talk to us a little bit about that evolution. Yeah, this is going back to the early 2000s when I was really noticing these problems. And part of the reason I noticed it is I had begun meditating and studying spiritual studies and bringing that into my life. I was teaching meditation. I was teaching people about self-realization. And so this was all happening simultaneous to these really demanding jobs of managing people's money and helping them with transactions. And so I did not come at it from the psychology standpoint, which is what nowadays we look back at the field of like financial psychology wasn't even out there at that time. So I didn't even realize it was a psychological thing. I actually thought it was a spiritual crisis. I started to notice a spiritual crisis that people were going through and not dealing with. And then it was coming out in their relationship with money. And so what happened was as a financial advisor, I started asking my clients if they would meet me for coffee or tea to tell me about their relationship with money, just and answer questions. And I started doing this for a solid year. And I would have conversations that people would be, they go on for like, they were supposed to be an hour and three and a half hours later, I was like, well, I've unlocked Pandora's box for this person, you know, and all of a sudden, like one gal announced she was getting divorced from her husband after our conversation. And I was like, Oh, wow. And another person quit their job. And then another person started a business. And I just started noticing that these being able to speak about what was happening under the surface helped people realize that they were not living intentionally and on purpose in what was most important to them. And that got me hooked. Then I started doing all this research to find out what I could do to help. So the transition was gradual. It was over a 12 year period. And it wasn't until 2014 that I was like, wait a minute, what if I actually just devoted my life to helping people in this capacity? Wow. So it almost sounds like on the one hand, this job in this corporate industry, right? And then you had the spiritual development on the other side. And it seemed like at one point they were separate bubbles, but then at one point you realize maybe this is like a Venn diagram. And then you realize, wait a second, there's more overlap here than I realized. And it sounds like you did a lot of research 
first to really dive in and really understand what was going on with people. And it sounds like those conversations were really transformational within just a short amount of time. You were able to get to the root and have people basically shine a light on the darkness of what they hadn't really been paying attention to in terms of their money and really help them get to a new place in a short amount of time. Yeah. I think I noticed the standards that people thought that they were living to and what was truly the higher ideals that humanity and that we as human beings need to have to be able to attain inner peace. And I saw the difference. And I was like, what if I shined the light of possibility on this opportunity to actually have money? Because let's face it, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you are struggling to figure out how to pay your bills, it is impossible to self-actualize. It just doesn't happen. There's a small minority of people, monks, nuns, who have like given it all up and they totally choose a different path, but not the path that most of us are choosing. And that was what I was completely obsessed with. Could I have this inner peace and still have money to take care of my needs, to make a difference in the lives of my children, my community, the world at large? Like, what would that look like? And that was the mission. So then at what point, so you were having these conversations and you were realizing that people needed this additional support and help. And so then at what point did you then say, okay, I'm going to make this a real go at this. I'm going to quit my job and focus on this. How did that come about? Yeah, I write about this in the book. And fortunately, it wasn't the story I'd like to be telling. And that was, I found myself at this time in my life where I wanted to make the change, but I was too scared to walk away from my career. Even though by that time we were financially independent, we could have been fine with our investments. And I witnessed one of these horrifying shootings in my doctor's office. And my doctor was killed and other people were shot. And I was not shot. My life continued beyond that day. And That day shook me up so badly that I made a pact with myself, even in the moment, that if I were able to leave this doctor's office alive, that I was going to leave behind my career and start to focus on these things that I knew could make a huge difference in the lives of others. And I felt like it was a way of just really embodying that integrity that I wanted to show other people about. And unfortunately, it was this terrible situation. Well, oh, man. I mean... It sounds like such an unfortunate circumstance, but one that led to such a beautiful outcome. I mean, look at where you are now and the lives that you touched. And so now I want to talk about, because I know from that grew your business and the Mindful Millionaire. I remember back when you were first coming up with the title for the book. And there was some hesitation around the wor- putting the word millionaire on the book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the book was originally not written with that title. And then when we were putting the proposal together, because we put it out to publishers to buy the rights for it, my agent was like, what do you think of the mindful millionaire? And I was like, I mean, I get it, but I don't because I felt like it was elitist or like people couldn't relate to it if they weren't aspiring to be a millionaire. And when the publisher St. Martin's Press bought the rights, they loved the title so much. So it instead of it being a working title, they kept it. And then it began to inform me of what the book wanted to be. And so I made a lot of changes to adapt the book to that message. And I think it's one of the reasons why the book has been so successful. We've sold over 10,000 copies. It's continuing to be what you always hope for in a book, a perennial seller. So two years in, one person recommends it and we'll see a huge influx of purchases, but it continues to be a steady seller. And I continue to find new markets that it's being used in, which we can talk about, which is just totally fascinating to me, but it kind of leads into the work that I did in the beginning has shifted over time because I realized that I have the ability when I meet with people, whether it be in a group or in a one-to-one situation where I have the ability of seeing exactly where that fear edge is in people within minutes. And typically the fear edge, the way I can explain this is this is the reason why we're not taking bigger leaps in our investing strategy or in our business. Just like I said, I had to take because of maybe going through it so intensely, I developed this sixth sense of being able to understand where are you actually holding yourself back from your dreams. And so 
the book became a journey of helping all these people figure that out for themselves and then creating a pathway inside the book that helps people do that for themselves. But now it's translating into all different industries. Like day traders are using my book to understand where they're stuck and where they're not willing to increase their number of trades or increase the size of their trades. And so you can see how it's just fascinating. I would have never imagined that what I learned to do is now having so many different impacts in so many different places in the world. We'll get back to our conversation with Lisa in just a minute. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment? Perhaps you're afraid like we were that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest and we'll take it from there. That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And now, back to our chat with Lisa Peterson. So when we think about the thing that's holding somebody back or holding a day trader back from making more transactions or an investor making more investments or bigger investments, what are they really afraid of? If we dig and we dig and we dig, what is it that they're afraid of at the end of the day? And how do they overcome that to get to that point of freedom from the ties and the really the constraints of their emotion is really what it is? Yeah, put simply, it is most definitely a self-worth issue, but that's too broad. So we'll even go deeper than that, but I'll just see if that resonates or if that makes any sense. It is totally a hundred percent related to our own self-image, how we see ourselves as what causes us to make decisions or not make decisions going forward. This is regarding anything outside of our comfort zone. If we want to do something that we've never done before, we want to try something new. It is going to like water trickling to the lowest denominator, it will find its way to this place of self-worth issues that are translating and activating fear points in our subconscious or conscious awareness. Mostly it's subconscious. So one of the big challenges is, like I said, it's the sea we swim in. So most of the time, it's going to be really tough for us to know that thing because we think it's non-negotiable. It's always going to be there. There's no way out. And so the book is like asking you those questions to start to say, well, how do I think about these things? Where are those problem points in my past? You probably heard like our relationship with money is pretty solidly formed by the age of seven and eight years old. Many things that I help people understand and heal have to do with before that time, but keep showing up in our lives 50, 60, even 70 years later. But once we get to them and we realize that we were creating a belief system that we based our whole identity on aren't true, 
we actually become like a whole new person. Like it's like a reinvention of how we see ourselves and we can start to create the self-image that we want rather than the one that the five, six, seven, eight-year-old decided we were. Yeah. So fascinating. You know, I was just talking about this with a friend yesterday and everything that she talks about, everything that she says comes from a place of scarcity and a fear that there's not going to be enough money or, oh, I can't buy that because it's too expensive. And I'm like, too expensive relative to what? Like, how are you coming to that conclusion? But the way that she was raised, she grew up very poor, right? And so exactly like you're saying, the way she lives her life decades later is because of the way that she grew up and these money rules and money things, her experience of life as it ties to money, probably when she was like a child, a very young child, four or five years old, watching her parents struggle with money and how they dealt with money. One thing that came up in our conversation was where is this scarcity mindset coming from? And is it still serving you in your life today? And she was like, I don't know, I guess it's from my past. And we just had this really interesting conversation around scarcity. So because I think that is what drives her whole, I mean, I'm talking about everything from like big investment decisions to like, do I buy a mocha latte to do I buy like the Lululemon shorts or the Gap ones or Old Navy It comes out everywhere. So for folks out there who might realize that, oh my gosh, I'm living in scarcity mindset, what is your advice to those people to help them reevaluate the approach that they're using and ask questions like, is this mindset really serving me? And if it's not, how do I replace it with something better? Or what are your thoughts on the scarcity mindset? I think that the awareness that it's there is the first step. I think a 12 step, it's like, I understand that I actually have a problem, that I am looking through this lens of scarcity rather than abundance. And the way to know that, right, is you think that in order for you to win, someone else loses, or there's this idea that every decision that is made has a loser associated with it. Like there's some really embedded way of like the other part that we can get into is like a victim. And it's so weird because people who are wildly successful, we all have this. It's just that edge. Like at what point do we flip over? So the awareness of Am I looking at things from a scarcity standpoint? What areas of my life is this showing up in? Because maybe it's not showing up at home, but it's showing up at work or in your business or in your investing strategies. I'm only willing to go up to $50,000 in an investment that I work with Annie and Julie on. You know, like, where is it showing up? Just see where it's coming up and then ask yourself, why am I confronted with this over and over again? What is underneath this story? What are my beliefs about myself and the world around me that cause me to think this way or to feel this way or to get so uncomfortable? So you've got to be willing to go into those particular situations in your life and look at them and ask yourself simple questions like, what's happening? Is this serving me? Is this helping me get to the place that I want to go? The other thing that, because people are listening to this conversation with a wide spectrum of backgrounds, there will be some folks who are just now beginning this journey of saying, I want to go more outside of my comfort zone, but I keep struggling with that. You're going to just look at the questions that relate to like a very specific thing. Like what's one goal that you have for yourself that you haven't been able to take action on and move forward with? Go into that particular problem. Now for someone who's does not stop, like pretty much everyone's got it. Even Elon Musk has got his own stories, right? It's not about how successful you are. When you look at your growth as a human being, when you look at how good you are at taking steps out into the unknown, wherever that is for you, look at that edge, look at what keeps you from going forward and ask yourself, what beliefs did I get from my family? What am I contending with? Maybe you see other people who have had no problem with this, but you do interview them. Ask them like, well, how did you make that decision? What did you do to go through your decision-making process? And what will happen is as they're telling you that, you're going to be like, wait, that was easy for you? Explain that to me more. Because then you'll start to find where you're like, they're saying it's easy. And you're like, I've never thought of it. That seems hard. I don't know what to do. And once you've caught it, once you've caught the belief, 
now it's just a matter of time is the way I like to think of it. Like you get my book, you could work with the coach. The hardest thing for many people is just understanding like, what is it? You want something, but you're not giving yourself permission to go after it. And what is holding you back? Does that help? Oh my gosh. It's so funny, Lisa, as you're describing this, I can specifically recall an experience that I had as it relates to taking risks and doing exactly what you just described. And it was when I met Annie and she was like, I met her at a conference and she was like, I just quit my job like a month or two ago or whatever. (laughs) I'm like, how did you do that? My edge was like, I had already put in like my notice and like didn't follow through because they gave me all this good stuff, money and whatever. And so then I didn't have the confidence, right? And like, maybe if I had read your book back then, I would have done it sooner because I would have identified my edge. It's so fascinating, this edge that you're talking about. And so for me, when I met Annie, I was like, well, how did you do that to gain the comfort, right? Like, how did you do that with two young kids at home? What did that mean to you? And her answer is very Annie. Well, I just did it. I just did it. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's so amazing and so inspiring. And that was what gave me everything that you just described. I went through that experience myself. The following Monday after Annie and I had this conversation, went and put in my notice and left my job, right? So it's like this idea of there's almost a process that you have to go through to get comfortable with risk and understanding where your edge is and asking, poking around and asking questions in that little bit past your comfort zone or past your edge, as you're calling it, to get comfortable with the risk to be able to move forward. So fascinating. Yeah. So fun to hear you. I get chills when you're talking about it. It wasn't all that long ago that I found out that this day trading coach was making all of his clients read the book. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I never even thought of day trading. I'm not a day trader. I have a good friend who is a day trader. And I went to her and I was like, what's happening? Like, how are they using this? And I got into understanding day trading and the psychology underneath it. And I was like, wait a minute, this is exactly what I do with entrepreneurs. This is exactly what I do with other types of investors. It's the same thing. And so I'm working with this coach now because we're looking at the opportunity to help his clients. And we're doing some case studies because the challenge is, is I want to make sure that someone's only trading better, not worse. And one of the things when you get into the psychology of why we do the way that we do, if you're not working with someone who really understands the underlying patterns, you can actually make somebody struggle more because they don't know how to complete the cycle of helping somebody move through, identify what the problem is and actually close that door once and for all. So you never deal with this scarcity pattern again. And that's one of my superpowers. So it's fascinating just to see all the places that it could show up really had no idea. Well, we need to, maybe we should make this, make Lisa's book a part of our, and help our investors find their edge and understand where they are at because Number one thing, feedback that I've gotten from especially female investors is they're afraid to take risks. And if they can identify their edge and like figure out where do I go from here to gain the comfort, they can start making moves in the right direction that they need to find success in investing or in other areas, it sounds like, of their lives. It's amazing how this could translate across so many different areas of someone's life. So I love it. All right. Well, we are going to move into the last part of our show. It's going to be three questions. You may remember them. They're a little bit similar, but a little bit different. This is our Life and Money Show Spotlight Round. We're going to ask you a couple of questions around life and money. So the first question is around your life and money. So what is one thing that you're doing to live a meaningful and intentional life by design? I think I'm doing right now is planning out some kind of sabbatical actually, because my son is going to be graduating from high school. My daughter is 24. Five and doesn't need us. My son is about to graduate from high school in May. And my husband and I are ready to travel in ways that we did some traveling when he was in fifth grade. We took him out of school for a year and we loved it. And we had so much fun. And it's part of the reason we ended up here in Sedona and we got to live in Hawaii, but we're ready to totally do this remote lifestyle. So travel the world while working remotely is the plan. And I'm a planner and there are steps. And so we're working on that right now. 
Well, very exciting. I'm so excited to watch your journey. And after you've been on the journey for a little while, we'll have to bring you back on the show and hear about your adventures because this show is all about this life by design. It's not just about making a bunch of money, but it's also about how do we live the life that we love. So I'm so excited for you. But yeah, man, I think I'm going to literally cry for like days and days when my last kid goes graduates from high school and I'm just going to be like, I have nothing to do. <laughs> But very exciting. Very exciting. All right. Second question is around others' life and money. So what is one life or money hack that you can share that'll make an impact in others' lives right now? I'm very obsessed with is the journey around creating more flow in our lives. I call it unshakable flow. And it's inspired by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work around flow, but taken to a very practical level. I've learned that when we understand these four stages of flow, we can give ourselves a lot more grace in life. And the thing that people don't understand is that the first stage of flow is actually struggle. And people think that they just pop into flow. They don't realize that struggle is a key component of the whole experience, whether you're a business owner or investor or something else or a parent, that the struggle and the way you can think about this or measure it is that if something you're doing has a 30% chance approximately of not working, there's a good chance you're going to kick into struggle. And because your fear is that I'm spending all this time or I'm spending all this money and it might not work. But by going through that, it activates all these cool things in your body and your biology, chemistry that cause you to go into the next phase, which is release. It's like the relax. So that's when we go take the shower. We're like working on something. It's not coming together. We take the shower, all the ideas come and it kicks us into flow. Flow is the third stage. The fourth stage is recovery. When we master these four stages, it's amazing what can happen in our life and business. So that's my hack for today. So interesting. It's so cool when you give these stages that one goes through and experiences when you can give them names and you can identify, oh, that's where I'm at, or here's where I'm going, it helps things to feel more normal, I guess, and makes it feel like you're on the right path. Whereas when you're in the midst of struggle and you don't know why or what you're going through, and it's like, ah, it's not supposed to be like this. But when you have the vocabulary, so even that, that's such a great gift to everyone who's listening is to just know to have that vocabulary to understand like, where am I at and how do I get to a place of flow, which I think is very hard for people. It's definitely hard for me. Annie probably remembers when we used to coach with our coach, I'm all hustle, no flow. And trying to find that flow can be difficult. So good takeaway, good hack. I love that. All right. Last question is around life and money in the world. So what is one thing that you're doing right now to make the world a better place? I would say this science around breakthroughs, helping people find their edge is really the thing that will probably be left as being my biggest legacy. I got people to think differently about about money and uncertainty and struggle and having a lot of fun with it. And just shifting that conversation around it and bringing more energy to the places in people's lives where they've been very, sounds like energy neutral or energy poor, has the potential to shift so much in their lives as you've seen and you've been a part of. So Lisa, I know that our listeners are going to want to follow up and learn more and potentially work with you and hopefully get a copy of your book. So tell them where can they find you? Where can they get a copy of the book and follow you? Thank you. So the book is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all over the world, The Mindful Millionaire. And if you get the book, you should go to the mindfulmillionairebook.com. And on that site is freebies and all kinds of good stuff that meditations and other things. But if you just want to come to the website and get some a meditation and some other cool tools that we've developed, you will go to wealthclinic.com forward slash vision and you get all kinds of a sampler of different things that we have created as gifts. Fantastic. Elisa Peterson, business strategist, money coach, podcast host, founder of The Wealth Clinic, and author of The Mindful Millionaire. Lisa, thank you so much for coming back on and sharing all your progress and your updates with us and our listeners today. Thank you both so much and for all your listeners. You've been listening to The Life and Money Show, the number one podcast for people who, like you, are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth, and making an impact in the world. 
For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com and be sure to join the Life and Money Show community on Facebook. And if you got value out of the show, please subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations.